the Galactic Empire was likely the most powerful military force the galaxy had ever seen. Not only did it have one of the largest armies in galactic history, they also had access to the Death Star, a weapon so powerful it could destroy an entire planet in only an instant. However, this got me thinking, could a singular Dyson Sphere, otherwise known as a Kardashev Level 2 civilization, defeat the Empire? These structures are almost unimaginably large. Englobing a whole star in solar panels, these structures are designed to capture all of a star's energy, which of course is an almost inconceivable amount. So could just one of these behemoths go head to head with the might of the entire galactic empire? In this video, I will explain the capabilities of both factions and will finish the video by deciding which one should win this versus. But first of all, some rules. We will suppose that any ships from the Star Wars galaxy have full access to science fiction based abilities. For example, all Imperial ships will be able to travel through hyperspace. On the opposing side, the Dyson Sphere will have access to technology that humanity will likely be able to make within the next 10,000 years or so. So for example, the Dyson Sphere will have full use of nuclear fusion transmutation, star lifting, advanced manufacturing, etc. For anyone who has no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry, I will briefly explain these concepts later on in the video. And trust me, they are pretty awesome. Just like in the real universe, the Dyson Sphere will not have access to any technology that breaks the laws of physics, such as faster than light travel. However, I will also explore two scenarios. One where the Dyson Sphere has access to Kugelblitz black holes, and one where they do not. Some of these concepts are absolutely mind-bending, and I'll leave a link to both Isaac Arthur's channel and Orion's arm for those of you who want to learn more. So what is a Dyson Sphere? Well, in reality, when most people talk about a Dyson Sphere, what they actually mean is a Dyson Swarm. This monstrosity is comprised of millions upon millions of solar panels orbiting a star and collecting the vast majority of a star's sunlight. The amount of energy is almost impossible to imagine, so to make it easier to understand, I will attempt to put it into some sort of perspective using the internet's favourite energy measure, tonnes of TNT. So this explosion you are watching now is 100 tonnes of TNT, all igniting at once. Pretty big, right? Well, the first nuclear weapons used in World War II were roughly 150 times more powerful than that, with a yield of around 15,000 tonnes of TNT. However, it would not be long until far more powerful weapons would be produced. In 1961, the Soviets would develop the Tsar Bomber, the most powerful explosive ever created by mankind, at least so far. This weapon was over 3,300 times more powerful than the nuclear weapons used during World War II, and had a blast yield equivalent to 50 million tons of TNT, or 50 megatons. It was said that the blast would have given anyone within 100 kilometers third degree burns, and that any building within 50 kilometers would be utterly destroyed. So how many Tsar bombers worth of energy would a Dyson sphere around a sun like ours be able to collect? If the solar collectors were all close to 100% efficient, a Dyson swarm would collect 2 billion Tsar bombers worth of energy every single second. Of course, this amount of power is absolutely insane, and many ask, what would you actually do with all this energy? And more specifically, how could it help you defeat the entire galactic empire? Well, if you are trying to create a Dyson Swarm with the specific aim of combating the galactic empire, it turns out there are several theoretical technologies that could help you. This amount of power could be directed into giant lasers, known as nickel Dyson beams. These have the destructive power of millions of nuclear weapons worth of energy, all being directed at a target either close by or hundreds of light years away with the use of giant lenses. These lasers can also be used to accelerate ships to crazy speeds, although not faster than the speed of light. As well as starships, this could also be used to accelerate relativistic kill missiles or RKMs. These are effectively swarms of thousands of asteroids sped up close to the speed of light. Just one 100,000 ton RKM sped up to 99.9% .9 of the speed of light would instantly vaporize almost any planetary atmosphere. Not a bad super weapon. The energy could also be used for the production of ships through the use of several processes. The first is known as star lifting. This process is quite complicated and has several variants but I'll briefly explain the most basic form here. By using the energy collected from the Dyson Sphere, energy can be refocused onto specific spots on the Sun, superheating those areas. This would cause a continuous and powerful solar flare, 
with huge amounts of mass being ejected into the sun's solar wind. By using giant magnets, also powered by your Dyson sphere, any erupted matter could be expelled in superheated jets at the poles. Theoretically, using gigantic tubes to cool and slow down the jets, the matter from the sun could be collected. If we used all of the sun's power for star lifting, it would be possible to collect around the mass of the moon each year, or this massive number. Star lifting would be an especially big worry to any invading empire if this process is used in conjunction with nuclear transmutation, a process in which smaller atoms like hydrogen can be turned into heavier elements such as iron and aluminium. While scientists can only currently do this a few atoms at a time, it is conceivable that an advanced enough civilization with enough energy and a big enough particle accelerator could do this at a macro scale, and in a best case scenario could even produce a net gain of energy. As stars are predominantly hydrogen, this process could allow a Dyson sphere to turn all the hydrogen collected during star lifting into useful elements, such as iron, copper and gold, which could then be used to create starships, robots and given enough time, even new planets. So how many capital ships, let's say the size of an Imperial Star Destroyer, could be made using these processes and a Dyson Sphere? So according to Forbes, which for some strange reason has gone from talking about rich people to discussing the weight of Star Destroyers, estimates the one Imperial Star Destroyer would weigh around 4.4 billion kilograms. So let's assume that our Dyson Sphere uses 50% of its energy star lifting, lifting around half the mass of our moon each year. Assuming that the Dyson Sphere has good enough manufacturing capabilities and that all of the mass is used to create star destroyers, the Dyson Sphere would produce over 263,000 star destroyers, not each year, not even each month. The Dyson Sphere could theoretically produce 263,000 ships the size of a star destroyer every single second. All this lifted mass could also be used in conjunction with Kugelblitz black holes, which would increase the power output of even a Dyson Swarm by several orders of magnitude. Since these may not be possible to make, I will explore these later on in the episode and first do the matchup without access to this bizarre futuristic technology. So how does the Empire compare? Well, using Legends numbers, which are significantly larger than canon, it was said that the Empire consisted of millions of starships and trillions of crew. So, about the output of a minute or so from our Dyson Sphere, at the very best. A definite win for the Dyson Sphere. But what about weaponry? Well, here's where it gets interesting. Estimating the amount of energy in a turbo laser proves to be quite difficult. I will use all upper limit calculations, which are based on the Star Destroyers apparently having enough power to slag a planet's surface. To melt a planet's surface to the depth of one meter, it is estimated that an Imperial Star Destroyer would need the firepower equal to 40 Tsar bombers or 2 billion tons of TNT per second. This is certainly not something we have seen demonstrated in Star Wars. In fact, in the Star Wars Rebels series, Thrawn orders a planetary bombardment of Chopper Bays. Here, we see that turbo laser fire causes only the tiniest of explosions, easier measured in firecrackers than tons of TNT. However, to give the Empire a chance, let's say the Thrawn was only toying with the Rebels, or was low on power, and in fact Star Destroyers have a maximum power output closer to our previous figure. Assuming this then, what is the total power output of the Imperial fleet? Well, if we assume the upper limit numbers to be correct, the Imperial Navy consisted of around 10 million Star Destroyers, so that gives the Imperial Navy the firepower of over 400 million Tsar bombers per second or just around a quarter of the total output of the Dyson Sphere. So seemingly another win for the Dyson Sphere, right? Well, not exactly. The Death Star's total energy output is absolutely insane. In fact, the total amount of energy required to destroy Alderaan would equal to 9 days of the Sun's total energy output. So ultimately, who would win? Well, based upon firepower, the Empire comes out on top, simply due to the immense power of the Death Star. If the Death Star shot its super laser at the Dyson Swarm, it would likely destabilize the star and destroy the whole Dyson Swarm, something I personally think would look awesome on the big screen. However, Kardashev 2 civilizations may have another trick up their sleeve. They may be able to create Kugelblitz black holes. Kugelblitz black holes are effectively black holes made out of an insane amount of light and take advantage of a process known as Hawking radiation. Without going into too much detail, Hawking radiation is the process in which black holes shrink over time, releasing energy in the process. Rather counterintuitively, the smaller the black hole, the more Hawking radiation it produces. 
So a black hole weighing 300,000 tons will release around 1 million tons of TNT worth of energy per second, while a black hole weighing only 1,000 tons will release 8,500 times more than that. That is the equivalent of 170 Tsar bombers every single second. So where is this energy actually coming from? Well, this energy isn't created out of nowhere and is best explained using Einstein's theory E equals mc squared. This equation basically proved that matter and energy are one and the same, and that there is a crazy amount of energy locked up inside even the smallest amount of matter. If we somehow converted even one gram of matter into energy, it would cause a giant explosion. In fact, this is essentially the process that we use on Earth in our nuclear weapons. So why is this significant? Well, this is where our black holes are getting their Hawking radiation from. The black hole is essentially converting some of its mass into energy, shrinking the black hole very slightly in the process. Future civilizations may be able to utilize this by feeding matter from a star back into the black hole, preventing it from shrinking. This would effectively provide the civilization with a matter to energy converter, and when you have a massive star to play around with, that's an awful lot of energy. If a Dyson sphere were to use all its available mass from star lifting, about the mass of a moon per year, and converted it all using Kugelblitz black holes, then the Dyson Swarm would have access to 6.5 duodecastillion joules of energy per year. That's the equivalent energy of a quadrillion Tsar bombers every single second. That's almost 22 million times more powerful than the Death Star, giving the Dyson Swarm a little bit of an advantage over the poor Imperials. However, even with this insane level of power, the Imperials may still have a chance. As the Dyson Sphere is limited by real-world physics, none of its ships, projectiles, or stellar lasers can travel faster than light. As the Imperials can use hyperspace to move across vast distances, they may still be able to mount some kind of attack against the Dyson Swarm, albeit from afar. The Dyson Swarm could use its immense power to torch every single planet in the galaxy. But due to the limit of the speed of light, it would take tens of thousands of years for its planet-killing lasers to reach the outermost planets in the galaxy. Although this means that ultimately, all life is doomed, it does give the Emperor some time to plan and mount a counterattack. So overall, I would say the Dyson Sphere wins 7 out of 10 times, just on the off chance that the Empire is able to create some sort of superweapon to destroy the Dyson Swarm, before all life is extinguished from the galaxy. However, if it turns out the faster than light travel does exist in the form of wormholes or warp drives, then this becomes a very different story, with the Empire being crushed before the battle was even started. So it's good to know that if all goes well over the next few thousand years, humanity would have a chance against an invading force of space wizards and star destroyers. I hope you've learned a little bit about random theoretical megastructures from this video. Let me know if you would like me to do more faction verses from any sci-fi universe, or if you would like me to elaborate on any of these real-life superweapons. Many of them I haven't even covered in this video, as they were just too insane. Thanks for watching guys, and as always, may the force be with you.